Well, today we're in the book of Mark again, and uh, we're going to be talking today about disappoints, disappointments may be his appointments. And I'm in the book of Mark chapter 5, and uh, today as we share the word of God. But from the book of Mark, as you'll see there in your study guide, the first thing is there's a parade of miracles that happens, but how Jesus has power over some things. Now, there are some things that he today, he possesses all power. Let's establish that first. The Bible declares that he possesses all power in heaven and in earth. There's no limitation to his power. There's no limitation to what God can do. There's no limitation to the might of his hand today. He has power first over danger. And realizing this day, he has power over, as we've seen and we saw last week, over a raging storm and a stormy sea and how that he delivered his disciples and provided for them and secured them and saved them. So in our lives, he too provides the miracle of helping us in times of danger, that he has power over anything that comes against us. I like the way that Isaiah put it, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. The second thing today that he has power over is demons. And so he rebuked, as we see in the book of Mark, you can read about how that he rebuked the demons from the maniac of Gadira and how that this man was set free. I'm glad today we can be set free from every demon of sin that would try to invade our lives and overtake us. I'm glad that the Lord has the power today to save. He has the power to keep saved. And he has the power today to keep all demon oppression away from us. The third thing that he has power over is disease. Now, he healed the broken, the bruised, the battered. He touched folks with his hand of healing. And this same God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm glad he's still the great physician. I'm glad that the Old Testament declares him as being Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who is our healer. And therefore today you can pray, you can believe, and you can receive the healing that he will provide. Some of you sitting in this room are living, walking testimonies to the power of our God and his touch and what he can do. So knowing that today, we, hallelujah, have a doctor that does not practice medicine. He is perfect medicine. And I'm glad with his stripes we're healed. And then the last thing today is he has power over death. Praise the Lord. I'm glad the sting of death has been removed. The victory of the grave has been taken away. And I'm glad today that death is not a defeat for a Christian. It simply becomes a graduation day. On the third day, death could not defeat him. He and the grave could not hold him, thank God. For he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And today he's alive. Isn't that wonderful to know today? I mean, you know, we celebrate Christmas, but... You know, thank God he's still not a baby laying in a manger. Thank the Lord that he went to a cross 33 years later, and he died there, placed in the tomb, but on the third day, he won. And folks, I'm glad today in Christ we are winners through his power that he has over death today. Well, I got a little story for you today. Did you hear about the pastor who was preaching on death? Speaking of death, he said, every member of this church is going to die. And a little boy on the front row started to giggle real low. Well, the preacher didn't like that, so he increased the volume and he turned it up a little bit more. And he said, every member in this church is going to die. Well, the little boy then just simply laughed out loud. He thought that was the funniest thing. The preacher stopped and said, son, what's so funny about that? The little boy said, I'm not a member of this church. Uh, all right. Remember not, everybody's going to die, right? I'm in the book of Mark, chapter 5, starting with verse number 21 down through 24, and then we're going to jump and go into verses 35 through 43. The Bible says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy hand on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him. 
and much people followed him and thronged him. Now, at this point, Jesus is interrupted to perform a miracle by the woman who had had the issue of blood, had a blood disease for 12 years, no help, no hope, spent all of her funds, and she crawled through the throng of crowds and touched the hem of his garment. Well, you know what happened. He said, your faith has made you whole. And, uh, and so that was a place where they were on the way to the house of Jairus. Well, that took time. We pick up with verse number 35. When he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Could you imagine maybe what Jairus was feeling? Maybe if you hadn't stopped for this woman, if you had not been detained, maybe if we could have just pressed on. You know, I'm sure he felt a tremendous sinking feeling within his, his stomach and his, within his soul and within his spirit. And in verse 36 it says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Those are powerful words. You know what's so neat about those words? They were just not designed or given for Jarius. Those words, words are for you and I today. Whatever situation that we find ourselves in, you have, don't look at a situation that you think, you see, death today gives you the impression of all hope. It's gone. But I'm going to tell you, when Jesus is around, there's always hope. Amen. And so he said, be not afraid, only believe. I'm telling you today, as the people of God, be not afraid, only believe. And thank God when you do that, there's something else that will happen. You will receive. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and say, seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye you, make you this ado, and weep? The damsel was not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them out, put them all out. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entered into where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Tell I, I come and I, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, like, I like this word, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, and she was of the age of 12 years, and they, were, and they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straight, and listen to this. This may sound a little strange. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and he commanded that something should be given her to eat. Well, in verse 43, Jesus did not want this miracle advertised because his main purpose was coming to this planet. His main purpose wasn't come to come and to heal the sick. His main purpose was, and understand this, just not to teach lessons, but Jesus came to die on a cross. That God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to fix the death issue once and for all for every person. And I'm glad today we all face death, don't we? But it makes a big difference whether we face it with Christ or without Christ. It makes an eternal difference. And as a matter of fact, your life that you're living on this earth, it makes a difference whether you're dead in your sins or whether you're alive in Christ today. See, there are a lot of people on this earth that are physically alive, but they're walking corpses. They're dead. They're dead in their trespasses and sins, as the Bible tells us. But thank God, by the power of God, I'm glad today in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things, death, has passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You've got a new life in Christ today. So Jesus came and he today provided the only solution for the factor of death that we today have no control over. I was talking to someone this past week, and I said, you know, when we come into this world, we're given two dates. We're given a, a birth date. Well, we all know our birth date, don't we? But we don't know that second date. That's our death date. But it's so important that we prepare for that date. And the only preparation, excuse me, that will make a difference is the fact today that you've given your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from this miracle that we 
read today, we're given four practical lessons. Let's look at them. First today, when you're desperate, cry out to Jesus. Jesus was, and Jairus rather, was hurting because his daughter was dying. And so can you imagine the pain and the frustration that Jairus was feeling and must have felt at that particular time as he stood and he watched his only child grow weaker with no hope? It's a tough thing to lose a child. Some of you have, as we have. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. But God's grace is sufficient. Finally, in desperation, he ran. He knelt before Jesus. He began begging him for the help that he hoped that he could supply. And understand this about Jairus. Sure, he was a man of prominence and a man of wealth and a man of respect. But this man was a ruler and, uh, at this, and he was part of what we would call the Jewish tradition of leadership. And they were not applauding Jesus. They were opposing Jesus. So for him to come and desire for Jesus to come and touch his daughter, something had to be happening with him. For Jairus to run and fall at the very feet of Jesus, now he's rejoicing, or rejecting rather, the official position of his religious, his religious leaders and his religious teaching. Something is going on. God's dealing with his heart. See, that's what God does with us when he brings us to salvation. He deals with our heart. He brings us to a place of conviction. And I believe that's what was happening to Jairus. And honestly, when you, when you have a desperate need, it often causes people to turn to Jesus. I don't know how many times that people have come, you know, to me and said, Pastor, I've got this desperate situation. I need your prayer. I need your help or whatever it may be. And folks, you know, it has a way today to draw us. But you know, listen, we can only help people so much. Thank God our God can help people in every need of their life. He can take care of every burden. He can take care of every situation today. And when David prayed, when he was in trouble, this is what he said. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God from his temple. He heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. And aren't you glad today that God just doesn't hear you cry? But he answers the need of your life. He doesn't sit there and say, well, I'm, you know, I understand you got these problems or this sickness or this situation going on. And certainly, uh, I'm sorry, it's nothing I can do. I'm glad he can do something about everything. Amen. When we encounter challenges in life, our first reaction is to try and fix the problem ourselves. We always are looking for ways that we can solve what's going on. Folks, you can't solve nothing. I can't solve nothing. But we've got a God that can solve everything. We use prayer as the last resort when it should be our first choice. Amen. Pray. You know, I'm glad the word of God, Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. How many times do we try to fix the messes of our lives today because we do not bother. We don't want to bother the Lord or take the time to take it to him. Have we forgotten Jeremiah 33.3? Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Our God's a God who answers our prayers and meets our needs. The second thing is, when you're delayed, trust God's timing. We are impatient people, aren't we? I got any, any impatient people in this room this morning? Anybody impatient? I hold two hands up, because I'm doubly impatient. Amen. And probably many of you are too. Jesus answered Jairus' prayer by agreeing to accompany him to his home. So the first prayer was, will you come to my home? Yes. And Jesus was on his way. However, on the way there, a crowd, of course, we know mobbed Jesus. And a woman who had been sick for 12 years, as we talked about a moment ago, touched the hem of his garment. She was healed instantly. Her faith in Christ had made her whole. Now, what about Jairus? Put yourself today in his sandals. He has an urgent need. His daughter is physically, she's dying. He was anxious. He was nervous. Have you ever been in a place you're facing, you're waiting for an answer, you're waiting for a solution, you're waiting for something to happen, you're anxious about something? I mean, tell you what, man, it, lo it looks like the clock is in slow motion. One second seems like one hour. One hour seems like one day. And it just seems like you wait and wait and wait. 
Well, can you imagine what this man felt like? He had the answer beside him, but he can't get him to his house. He keeps getting derailed. His attention is being drawn to other people. And so he has this urgent need. Have you ever been in that attitude today where you beg God for something? You cried out, you begged God to hear your prayer, to answer your prayer, and it just seemed like sometimes the heaven becomes as brass. You need God to lay everything and everybody else aside, and you need your answer when? You need it now. I mean, you can't wait till tomorrow. You can't wait another five minutes. You want your answer now. There are four ways God answers prayer. Mark these down today. He answers prayer directly. Uh, sometimes God just gives an instant answer, quick answer. Well, it's because that's a part of God's will. It's not because you pull some string with God. It's not because that uh, you've got some uh, additional favor with God over someone else today. Let me tell you what, God sees us all on the same level. Amen. He is no respecter of persons. But he answers prayer according to his will. You can cry buckets of tears. You can throw temper tantrums and scream and holler. I'm going to tell you right now. You're not going to move God until it's time for God to move. Amen. The second thing is, he answers prayer differently today. Sometimes God doesn't give us what we ask for. <laughs> you know what that means? Sometimes we get an attitude with God. Well, God didn't answer my prayers. You know why God didn't answer the prayer the way that you wanted him to answer the prayer? It's because the way that you were seeking was a lesser way, and God had a greater way for you. So therefore today, an example is when Paul begged God to take away the thorn in his flesh. God responded and said, hey, hey buddy, my, my grace is sufficient for you today. So God gave Paul the grace to deal with his affliction, his trouble. You know that same grace is available for you and I today? He'll give us the grace that we need to deal with what we're facing. Third of the day, he denies our request. Wait a minute. You mean God says no to me? Yes. God says no to us sometimes. And the reason that God denies our request is because it's not his will. We are asking for something that's contrary to the will of God. We must keep in mind God always knows best. You may think you know the need right at that moment, but you, if, you, if that prayer had been answered the way that you wanted it, it could have had a great effect upon somewhere down the future. God answers prayer at the right time, the right way. So I look at it this way. When God says no, it means God's got something better. Amen. And then today he delays our request. This is the one that really plucks our nerves sometimes, doesn't it? This is what Jairus is facing at this point. It happened to Mary and Martha when, of course, their brother Lazarus had died. Jesus shows up four days late. <laughs> and those girls threw a fit. Jesus knew there would be a greater glory in raising Lazarus from the dead than just healing his sickness. Let me tell you what, there's a greater glory when he raises you from the dead of your situations that you're facing that you think there's no hope. If you're waiting for an answer today, let me tell you something today. Some of you, I feel in my spirit, you're on the edge of giving up. God has not called you to be a quitter and to give up. You've got to trust the Lord and wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall, re they shall renew their strength. Hallelujah. He'll, he'll give you the strength that you need. Remember Habakkuk. He began his prophecy with a prayer. How long? How long? Oh, Lord, will we have to wait? Well, what was he waiting for? He had a vision from God for the restoration of the people. He wanted the people restored. He wanted revival. He wanted a moving of God. And immediately God gave him the word, and this is what God said. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk 2 and 3. God is always on time, and God never makes a mistake. Amen. So that being the case today, you've got to wait on the Lord and realize he's got the answer, and the answer that he has is always the right answer. Amen. Now, it's tough waiting, isn't it? Because we, we are impatient people. We want things to move. We're living in the world. I mean, you know, you got 4G on your telephone, and that's still not fast enough. You got this on your internet, and it's at home, on your computer, and it's still not fast enough. I mean, what happened to the days of dial-up? 
where you sit there for five minutes waiting for the thing to finally belch and come up on the screen. Now, if it's not up in five seconds, we're about ready to pull our hair out. I mean, we're living in the world of fast, do it now, hurry up. Why do you think every one of these restaurants have drive-ins now so you can get in and get out quicker? Why do you think these restaurants now have these places that you can pull up beside, phone your order in on your cell phone, place your order, and somebody comes out to your car and brings your order, you don't even have to get out of the car because we want it now. We can't wait. Folks, listen. God sometimes tells us we've got to wait. And in that waiting process, we've got to trust the Lord. That's where we are developed. That's where we grow. That's where we know God is always on time, every time. And that he will answer that need and meet that need and we can trust him. Hallelujah. On time and makes no mistakes. Let's look at the third one. When you receive bad news. You've got to keep walking with God. You know what a lot of people want to do? Find the bed and pull the covers over their head. Jesus resumes his journey to the home of Jairus. But a messenger comes and says, I'm sorry, but I've got bad news. Your daughter's dead. So they said, don't trouble the master any longer. Let him go his way. Just come on back to the house. Let's have the funeral and get back to the routine of life. And I'm sure Jarius, probably because he's already been nervous and anxious, remember he was a ruler in the synagogue, he didn't have the faith, he didn't have the relationship with God. He had a religion, but religion does not get you into the presence of the Lord. That's man's way to God. God's way to God is through his son Jesus. And I'm sure that he collapsed in grief Hope seemingly had just sifted through his fingers when he heard those words. But actually, you know, hope was standing right there beside him in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You realize your hope is right here with you right now? Amen. We run here. We go there. We're looking for answers and solutions. We're trying to find ways out of what we're in and find solutions for what we're facing when our help is already right there. That's why David said, Psalm 121, I looked unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Amen. Before he could express his grief, Jesus had a word for him. He says, be not afraid, only believe. I mean, does those words really make sense when you've just gotten the word, your daughter is dead, there's death in the home, there's seemingly, I mean, death, that's finality. There's no hope after that. Or is there? These words were not reserved for Jarius only. As I look across this congregation this morning, these words are for you too. Be not afraid, only believe. And so today, Jesus is speaking to our hearts today in the disappointments of life, and he's telling us the same thing. Don't be afraid, only believe today. Believe today that there is a God. Believe today that God can do all things, exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think today. The best news that turns all bad news into good news is that your creator today wants to have a personal relationship with you. Amen. And I am glad today. I want to have a relationship with him too. And I pray you do also. In the Garden of Eden, sin interrupted the intimate relationship that God had with Adam and Eve. But Jesus came and, to rest and restored that ability today to walk and talk with the Creator. As the old songwriter wrote, And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Listen today. We have that assurance today. I think about the prophet Micah. He cuts right through the chase and summarizes today what God requires of us. And this is what he said in Micah 6 and 8. He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, number one, and to love mercy, number two, and to walk humbly or walk in dependence with the Lord or with God. So today, that's what God requires of us. Typically, when we're dealing with difficulty, our first reaction is to have fear and to doubt. 
But Jesus says, be not afraid, only believe. So fear says, give up. Faith says, never give up, only believe. You can't give up. Well, I just don't know what to do. You don't give up. You're succeeding. You're raising the white flag of defeat for the devil. There are no today defeated children of God. When God tells us in Romans 8, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. In a world of bad news, when babies are being aborted, when people are acting like animals in Ferguson, Missouri, and when ISIS is decapitating people, innocent people, when people are being slaughtered in Iraq, and when there's so much suffering and disease today, when families are struggling to provide Christmas for their children, when morals continue to drop to all-time lows today, there's something to remember today. God doesn't owe us an explanation. You can ask God why, why, why all you want to. I'm telling you, God doesn't owe you and I an explanation today. He's given us something better. He has given us today a promise. So why do you want an explanation when today you can take a promise? Amen. An explanation doesn't always provide a solution. He is your only solution. He gives us today a promise. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. He has promised all things work together for good to them, to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. I remember the words of the great old hymn Kelso Carter wrote, it says, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Hallelujah. We've got to get off of just sitting on the premises and start standing on the promises. Amen. We've got to really today trust God. Let me give you the fourth item and I'm through. When you face death, you can claim hope. Hallelujah. Do you know what hope means? The acrostic of hope says this, and I think it says it perfectly. Having only positive expectations. Amen. Having only positive expectations. That's a good definitive answer for hope today. There are two times when we all need to claim this hope. One today is he gives hope when you're experiencing grief. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, he said, But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You've got hope today. Hope in Christ. We're all going to experience grief in our times of life today. But when we know Christ, you know what? Our grief is instantly turned to hope today in Him. Jairus and Jesus walked into a scene of grief. Imagine the situation. The professionals, see, they hired grievers in those days. They were on the scene. They tore their clothes. They made loud cries and wailing, and they just absolutely made a scene. They were paid to do this. They played musical instruments that was loud and chaotic. And there was tension between these professional mourners and Jesus because Jesus said, make ye, uh, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel was not dead but sleepeth. And the mourners then, they replied back to him, and they laughed him to scorn. I mean, in essence, they're saying, don't mess with our business, man. We're getting paid to do this. This is no time for miracles, Jesus. Because you're going to interrupt our cash flow. Jesus said, that's enough. He said, it's time for you guys to get out and go. Amen. The Bible says Jesus put them out. He not only told them where the door was at, he took them to it. Amen. And they were not in charge, but Jesus was. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In this world, the devil's not in charge. Our God is. Amen. And so we find that grief is a painful process, but it's not a final destination for you and I today. God doesn't want you today to get stuck in the valley of grief. The Word of God says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Amen. So today, walk through but don't retain and don't remain in that place. Don't get stuck in your valley of grief today. And the second thing today, quickly, he gives hope when it's your time to die. But when Paul was facing death, death in a Roman prison cell, you know what he said about it? He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, man, I'm a winner either way. Hallelujah. When you follow Jesus, you're always in a win-win situation. If you love today... And live for Christ today. 
If you will live, your life can be today to glorify God. And even in death, it's to gain because you're taken into the presence of a mighty God. Jesus walked into a house full of death and grief and transformed it into a house full of life and rejoicing. And that's what he does when he saves us, doesn't it? I mean, today, where we were in grief and sorrow and our sin, hallelujah, when Jesus comes in, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Life is full of disappointments. But folks, let me tell you, if you're looking for God, then let me tell you what, in looking to God, he today can take your disappointments and turn them into an appointment of victory for you today. Put your faith in the mighty God that he is and trust him. What a great God we serve. And the church said, and the church said, amen. amen. Hey, praise the Lord a little bit. Thank you, Father, today for the time and the word. Thank you, Lord, that we have hope, we have victory, we have Jesus. I just pray today that you'll encourage the hearts of your people and overwhelm them with your presence, your power, your grace, and your goodness. Thank you for this beautiful day. And we just pray now your blessings upon the service which is to follow. May you today have your will and your way in our hearts and our lives. May your name be glorified, exalted, and lifted up. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.